Ten reasons why I'm not a psychic. I used to be a spiritualist. I spent numerous days of the week going to meditation sessions, going to healing groups and to services. I had a strong belief in it, spiritualism, new age and other relating ideas. I would say now, looking back, that I was deluded, that I was convinced of certain ideas and here are some of the reasons why I was confused. Indeed, some of the reasons why I am not a psychic nor a medium. I created visualizations in my own mind. This is encouraged. When it comes down to meditation groups, the idea is that you should visualize certain things. Guided meditation is a large idea within spiritualism, within new age and paganism. A great many people use visualization as a key tool to experience visual states within meditation. The thing is though, if you're creating it, how does that make it real? If you add to it by making it your focus, then how real is it? If you're creating the experience or allowing your mind to create the experience, then how much of it can actually be real in any sense of the term? I used to meditate on a daily basis. My meditation during my period within spiritualism and new age is focused around visualization. The problem with visualization is you think you're latching onto something greater than yourself, but in actuality all you're doing is repeating ideas in your mind, such as contacting spirit guides, angels and other forces and other energies. And this ensures that you end up with a greater level of conformity to your belief. But equally, by focusing on the meditation and making it more real, you make it appear to be more real to yourself. You establish stronger visual processes where you can actually feel what you're going through. By using visualization and meditation so much on a daily basis, you end up creating a far greater level of experience. But that doesn't make it more true. It simply means that you're creating the experiences more and more, developing those experiences, making them appear to be more real, and developing your belief, your absolute belief, that these things must be true. Although it's very easy to cherry pick ideas and say, I received this, or someone else got that, I would say that I never got anything that was so remarkable that it was above chance. That's to say, I would occasionally get something which is quite interesting and give it to a friend. For example, a name or some kind of idea, perhaps something which is more symbolic than actually literal. But even so, it would basically be something merely at the level of chance. Rarely, on occasion, giving out something which was perhaps slightly remarkable. But in most cases, I was merely giving out basic information, basic ideas, and ignoring the misses in favor of the hits. So if I gave someone a reading in a meditation circle, that's a meditation group, I would remember the hits and forget the misses, as would the person receiving the reading as a kind of confirmation bias. Mediums believe that they have experiences with spirits. I was never a professional medium, but even so, I thought I had experiences. The key point to actually having these experiences for practically everyone I know of is basically they go to a haunted place or go into a meditative state or go through some kind of process and then they experience. There was nothing really out of the blue as such, simply where the mind might wonder and you might think something. That's as near as it got to something out of the blue. The spirits that I thought I contacted or had some kind of connection to, like spirit guides for example, or dead relatives, they never really came out of the blue. There was usually something on my mind that I followed down a kind of rabbit hole of ideas. So although when I was recounting it to other people, a kind of experience I had, trying to understand it, I would think of it as if something had just come to me, but in actuality the experiences were provoked and therefore created by myself. It's the kind of process of visualization that many spiritualists get into, especially the devout, where they create the experiences in a more vivid form, where you can actually create visual effects, even certain effects that appear to be physical, such as you're in a dark room and there appears to be things like orbs, or you're going through a haunted house or a haunted castle and you think you see something, for example, a shadow or something going through a door at another end of a corridor, 
You're the one provoking the experiences. You're the one who's pattern seeking. You're the one putting it together. But you convince yourself that it's evidential that the experience is more than it actually is. There's always a mind behind the process. And when you're looking for things, when you're provoking things in your mind, when you see your life through that kind of picture of spirituality, you make these experiences part of your everyday motion. You see something and you make it fit the pattern. With devout spiritualists, they go far beyond merely believing in the spirituality aspect or practicing things in their spare time. The truly devout make their entire life about spirituality and feeling things, sensing things, opening their senses all of the time. And in this way, they delude themselves because what they're really doing is developing a delusion, which can include hallucinations. The effects from healing, crystals, and other spiritual stuff, the idea of it, say for example, Reiki healing, or the idea of interacting with crystals, or with certain Buddhist concepts, they sell you the ideas, and through your devotion, through your focus, you make them more than they are. Through your focus and belief, your spiritual delusion, you make it appear to be more, you make it appear to be real. It's simply where you've created these ideas within your mind, you establish a massive delusion within the concepts of what's actually real, and therefore you might feel some kind of energy from a crystal. You've created that idea within your mind to provoke the experience. The experience does not relate to energy in the New Age sense. It does not actually mean that the crystal itself is resonating with some kind of hidden charge or quantum reality. It actually means that you've created the idea in your mind. And as a result, people who are sold on the idea that a particularly powerful crystal is going to change their life, they feel a massive amount of change. It doesn't mean the crystal actually works. It simply means that you've deluded yourself about it. And understanding that process allows you to understand the nature of a great many of these ideas. The kind of placebo effect from holding a crystal or equally being healed or having someone activate your third eye or whatever the case may be. And of course, a big part is repeating beliefs, repeating ideas, remembering your hits and the hits of the mediums and psychics you've seen or the effects you get from the healer. So you have the placebo from the healer. You remember that because, oh, I had this massive effect. How do you explain that skeptic? Or when it comes down to a medium, they told me this, this and this, but you've ignored the rest of the reading where they got it wrong. But you remember the hits. You say, critic, how can you disprove that? And when it comes down to the tarot card reader, they told me a bunch of things that was going to come true. Refute that, cynic. But it's a question of bias. It's a kind of confirmation bias where you select out what works and then you use it as reinforcement for your belief. You make it more real by remembering the hits, remembering the good things with yourself and with others, and you make it seem to be real. This happens in a great many beliefs, and for devout spiritualists, it's very common. When it comes down to experiences that I've had, there is no way of me being sure that they could not be a delusion. No experience I have had or could have is beyond the ability of the mind to create, beyond the ability of the imagination. I may wish to believe that certain things are true, that certain things are the case, but that does not mean they are the case in actuality. It does not mean that they are factually correct, even if I believe them, even if I experience them. To see things that aren't there, to experience things that aren't true, to think things that are factually incorrect. To be under the misapprehension about the nature of things. A great many spiritualists claim that experiencing is knowing. But in actuality, experiencing is as far from knowledge as you can get. Since experience can be highly subjective, experience can be delusional, experience can be tainted by hallucination. Yet a great many people use the idea of the importance of experience as a way of proving their belief to themselves as much as other people. They insist because they've experienced things, it must be true. They presume that their mind could not create these things. But in actuality, the mind can create elaborate delusions. There are many reasonable psychological reasons why a person might well experience things which are not correct. Experience is changed according to my feelings and my beliefs. What I read, what I believed at the time. 
If I was feeling in a good mood, I might have a really good experience. If I was feeling in a bad mood, not so great or even bad. If I was reading a particular book, the kind of experiences I had would relate to that particular book. And people of different types of beliefs would have different types of experiences within the same meditation group. It suggests the massive subjectivity of experiences. A person who believes very strongly in the Hindu gods might well have very different experiences from a person who has a belief in the Christian God. So opinions vary according to people's beliefs, people's ideas, and when they read a certain book with a certain set of ideas, strangely, the spirit world operates in that way for them because they've accepted what's inside a particular book or series of books by a particular author or series of authors. It made me feel special. I was going through a dark patch in my life and I didn't have very many reasons to feel good about myself. I latched onto a belief that made me feel special. I held onto the idea that I was helping people by passing on messages or trying to communicate with my spirit guides. That by operating as a trainee healer, as I did for a couple of years, I was basically moving forward in my life. And things might not be good here, in this world, but my reward would be happiness in the world beyond. The development of my spirit, the development of my supernatural being, my higher self. This was a delusion, but it made me feel special. For people who don't have much in their life, and indeed that was the case at the time, it's very easy to fall into that kind of trap. To have the idea that you're some kind of star child, that you have special guides, you have secret knowledge, you have special information, and as a result, I fell into these ideas very easily. To believe that you have spirit communication with some kind of Buddha, or some kind of godlike character, or Jesus, or Native American spirit guide, it's very appealing, but it's simply a delusion. These things you experience are a question of hallucinations you generate through your belief. It might make you feel good, it might make you feel important, but meanwhile, your real world life is suffering. You don't deal with your money very well. You don't deal with your real world psychological problems. You don't deal with the issues that surround you. Instead, you hide within your belief, within your delusion, within the idea that you are special. And last but not least, I suppose the obvious one really, before someone puts it in the comments, I never won the lottery. You would think that, you know, maybe just to help me out, maybe to take me off the benefit system as I was at the time, maybe to get my life going in the right direction, just a few lottery numbers. No, that didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. I wonder why. It's almost like the spirits don't want to give you a hand. It's almost like they don't exist. Now I'm being flippant, I admit, but you've got to admit, there is the obvious fact that what people seem to get out of spiritualism is a psychological benefit, unless they're actually people making money out of it. And in some ways, I'm thankful that wasn't me. If I'd gotten into it, and truly gotten into it, and started making money off it, I don't think I could look at myself in the mirror considering the actual price being paid by people, the delusions I would create. And so I cannot understand how professional psychics and mediums who realise it's fake after a while but stick with it because they've got no other career choices. I cannot understand how they can continue to do it and still claim to have human sensibilities. So in that way, not only am I not a psychic, nor a medium, nor a healer, but I am glad that I didn't go too far down that path.